Susan Jack and hi everyone who's watching. Uh, we are so happy to be sharing our passion for the creative side of immersive technology and storytelling with, with you all today and hopefully you'll, you'll take a lot away from, from our conversation. So I was fortunate enough this week to, to meet Zoe and Susan for the first time and ha have a chat. Jack and myself have been working together on a, on a few projects for a few years now. Um, but I'd love to start by um, each of you introducing yourselves and I, I'll do that first just to break the ice. Um, so my, my name is Camille Donegan. I'm a virtual reality producer for the last six years. Uh, first two years probably don't count because I was just going around the country with cameras on my head and sticking a Samsung gear uh, headset on anyone who'd, who'd watch and say, this is going to be the next big thing. Um, but here it is. And uh, yeah, I've been actively producing for about four years now. So I'm um, working on an EU project for three years with Irish National Opera. Uh, I'm a producer on that project uh, called Traction. Um, I'm creative director at Solus Fior, which is a meditation app uh, available on App Lab if you have a quest. And uh, I'm also an independent producer working on several kind of theater and VR related projects. And um, myself and Jack just created a series of VR films to help anxious teenagers. Um, so, so that's a little bit about me. And my background actually is parallel careers in theater and tech. So when I discovered VR six years ago, I went, ah, this is where I fit. And, and absolutely, this is a convergence of the creative and tech sectors um, and we're really going to explore that the, the creative side of, of this of these arenas uh, now today so uh, maybe to yourself susan first i might get you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you uh, started adopting immersive and how it's adding value to the work that you create sure hi i'm susan cummings i'm a uh, founder of tiny rebel games and uh, my husband and, and business partner and i have been working together for about 23 years now um, making games in the industry. I come from a console background. I was at Take-Two for a long time. I started 2K Games and 2K Sports, and then I jumped into mobile and uh, didn't jump into augmented reality uh, until a few years ago uh, after being captivated by the very first HoloLens video. It's something that was in our back of our minds for a long time when the opportunity mm -hmm. came up a few years ago to put together a bid for the audience of the future from Innovate UK. And so uh, we led that process and brought a few uh, companies mm -hmm. together and uh, proposed a uh, rather ambitious uh, project for the moving image demonstrator, which would take uh, transmedia, as awful term as that is, but take a, a transmedia approach to content and bring together um, gameplay and uh, augmented reality and mixed reality and uh, video and tell story in real time. Uh, for every consumer to experience the story together and sort of shared water cooler moments was was the idea. And so we launched the Big Fix up in January, and um, which it, it is a really lovely showcase of a lot of cutting edge AR technology. And uh, right now we're working on city scale experiences. So later this year, uh, we'll be doing the, the live part of this experience that had to be delayed because of pandemic. And so that'll be uh, in Bristol and Cardiff and San Francisco later this year. And uh, so, and we, so we continue to iterate and play in the AR space and are anxious for consumer AR to become a more readily experienced thing. And uh, mm. so we're, we're really enjoying getting to be early uh, in that, like we are. And, and working with IP like Wallace and Gromit. Oh, <laughs> it's it's pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Thank you so much, Susan. Jack, I might ask you to introduce yourself next. And obviously you're you're in every aspect of immersive, but talk a bit about uh, how, how you got into it, maybe. Yeah, so I guess I'm, I'm Jack. I'm CTO of uh, Retinize and co-founder. And uh, we've been working for about six years in immersive media. Uh, what got me into it first was my brother brought home a DK1. He works in Silicon Valley and I was blown away and sort of suddenly, I think it's really fun watching that moment with everyone, particularly like the creatives who do the sort of like 10 year forecasting when they put on a VR headset of, oh, this is where it's going, oh God. <laughs> um, so yeah, that happened to me very rapidly. Uh, and so I decided to leave working in TV in London uh, and try and get some funding to uh, 
transition over to VR and immersive. Uh, so that was about six years ago. Um, so yeah, we made some shorts for Northern Ireland Screen, but then gradually started working for uh, bigger corporate clients, uh, Save the Children, uh, National Geographic, uh, BBC. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess in that process, we, you know, we started started out in cinematic VR, started moving into interactive uh, game engine type AR and VR experiences with different clients. Uh, and then we sort of stumbled across, I guess, well, we were struggling in that process because I guess creating uh, game content and animation content and iterating with that kind of content with clients and then delivering things to clients and then them asking for changes and realizing how long that process takes. Uh, that led us to developing our main software product now, which is called Animotive, which is all about, um, it's sort of a virtual production tool, uh, but it's trying to remove all those barriers that, you know, I guess when you open up Maya or Blender or something uh, and you go, oh God, this is complex. Um, we're trying to remove that and sort of make creating animation feel more like creating theater or <laughs> creating film and TV. Yeah. And I can vouch for that. Um, I've played a few characters in Animotive, so I get to dive in. I get to, to be an actor again and dive into the various characters, act out the nasty teacher, the scared kid in the toilet cubicle. And it's amazing. Like it's a whole new style of acting with you to be so conscious of your body gestures. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a, a new school of acting for, for this. And I'm remembering we actually met at this conference, the ARV or Innovate conference five years ago, I think, Jack. Yeah, and you showed me. That, uh, your cinematic 360 show reel on a headset, probably an Oculus yeah, and you, you let me experience your uh, Children of Lear experience flying oh, on the throne over the lake. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, um, we won't mention that, but uh, no one. This will is like ever, comparing ever MySpace pages or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But your cinematic 360 was, yeah was and still is like amazing and uh, zoe i'd love to to come to you and i know your theater company well and uh, a lot of actors uh, pals of mine have worked with big telly over the years so i knew as a theater company and didn't know and was so excited to to see that you guys are embracing immersive storytelling so tell us a bit about big telly and your journey to adopting immersive as part of your your tool set Yes, I will do. Thank you. Um, so yes, Big Telly is a theatre company. It's been going for a long, long time. And we've made a lot of site specific and immersive theatre work. Uh, we've done shows in swimming pools. And uh, with the tech within that, I suppose, you know, we would have blacked out massive swimming pools and had um, uh, live camera feed from underwater. Um, and we've always been interested in kind of using tech um, to extend the kind of possibilities of what an audience can see. Um, and we make a lot of site specific work, like I say, and a lot of work um, which is very audience focused. So we made a piece called The Worst Cafe of the World where the audience choose the stories from a menu um, and um, very interested in how to create intimate pieces of storytelling within uh, kind of recognizable environments. We've done a lot of game theater where an audience go on an adventure through the town, but they're spies and have to break into places and they have to find people in car boots. And um, they have to, uh, and we within that, we would hijack a lot of existing infrastructure like um, security cameras and intercoms and screens that are already there. Um, so, and the audience would have further phones and they have different kind of characters to communicate with um, who are part of the experience but you can't see. And with that, we're very interested in immersion in the sense of immersing people within an unfolding narrative within a familiar environment. So within the games, you know, you go on a journey and as far as you know, you're the only people doing it and people, people project a conspiracy onto the context. So people come back from the end of the games and say, I got the registration number of those beardy guys in that van. And we're like, they were nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and people just see things that they um, imagine are part of it. Um, and we do, you know, co-op police and traffic wardens and shopkeepers and bouncers and other people into that. So there's a kind of hierarchy of storytelling within that. So when the pandemic hit, we started uh, making some of this game theatre on Zoom. And we've now made 16 pieces of digital theatre. Um, and I suppose we've gone from the audience sitting in front of a screen to what happens if the 
audience or the actors or the uh, agents are on boats or showing us their own environments. What happens if this show happens, but everybody's in their own personal forest um, across the world. So we've been looking at what is the potential for mobile technology um, within uh, storytelling. And uh, the pandemic did cause us to flip and kind of accelerate that learning. We're now making shows which are based on apps, but all of the apps have got live overrides. So we continue to be interested in the blurring the boundaries between what's real and what's not and what's live and what's not so we have a show coming out called incognito which is controlled by an app but there are live um actors working within that who can override it and who can say check out that busker he's got something for you hidden under his guitar case so that you're not sure what is the app and what is the live experience so that's kind of where we're at at the moment I love that. And, and that's something I'm, I'm super passionate about is, is bringing those aspects of live performance into these storytelling mediums. And that's like something that Animotive enables, motion capture enables, volumetric capture. So bringing characters in, into studios, capturing them live and then bringing them into a, a, an A or, or a V or activation. And uh, I guess kind of parallel to that, yes, we've had a really, really tough time, particularly artists have been so so badly hit by the pandemic and and really struggled to you know survive financially. What, you know what are they going to do next? So I'd like to chat a bit about that. Like if you were to offer advice maybe to artists like that would be interested in stepping into immersive, where where do you think from your perspective those opportunities might lie? And uh, yeah, what, what are those kind of transferable skills, I guess, from say live performance, maybe people come from a theater background or indeed screen into, into immersive. Um, maybe Susan, could you chat a bit about that first? Can never find the mute button, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think what's interesting right now is it's a whole paradigm shift about what the format is. Um, so I think that the opportunities are, are limitless. Um, if, if, if some, if we're, if we're right, and clearly we are, that someday we're all going to be wearing glasses and those glasses will combine AR and VR and all that terminology will kind of go away. And it's just about, it's an experience and the format is what, what it should be. Um, then it, it touches on all aspects of our lives. It, it touches on, on healthcare system. It touches on enterprise. It touches on games. It touches on theater. Um, you know, we're all, we're all going to have these on and that's going to be how we, you know, what, what adds to the world around us. And so, um, so I think it's the opportunity to come forward with the creative ideas that you have in terms of how to tell a story, how to how to tell play, um, you know, game, gaming. I think all these things are starting to blur together, and the distinction between what's a game and what's a story and what's a film is, is, are starting to fall away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that convergence of so yeah, many you see you see it in gameplay. Like what what is a game is mm -hmm. very different from ten years ago. Yeah, um, you know, starting with things like the walking simulators you started to see in video games, and and you know, and that trend, right? And if you look at the Oculus Quest and you browse the store, half of it is just is 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 just um is is, is VR film, you know, and, and storytelling and things like that. So I think we we all become accustomed to the fact that it isn't it isn't just about games anymore. That 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 whole category, the definitions have been expanded. I mean, that was really challenging for us when we launched the big fix up. We said it's not a game. Mm. And that was a very hard message to get across and still is. And you yeah. know, we listed it in the app section of the store instead of the game section of the store in mm. the hopes that that would help. But people still expected it to be a game. And they came into it with their notions mm. of what gameplay means and what they should expect to find. And that's been a very, very, probably one of the biggest challenges of the project, as much as the technology, yeah. was trying to articulate what it was that we made. Okay, because it's a more narrative focus. Yeah, experience. and I think in terms of the things that Zoe's talking about, which I think find absolutely fascinating, by the way, it's the same thing, trying to articulate what this stuff is. So what is it? Is it a theater? Is it a game? Is it an ARG? Um, and trying to get users to come to that, the audience to come to that with the right frame of mind. On the plus side, you can rebrand things according to the funding application that you're applying for. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's game. Yeah, it's theater. Yeah, yeah it's uh, RPG. <laughs> so we might uh, ask you to come in on, on that about the opportunities for artists. Yeah, I mean, I think what's been what I've loved most about this last year, and we've worked with over um, 150 art, freelance artists okay. through our projects, is the democratization of the whole industry. It's the fact that design, particularly at the start when lockdown was at its most restricted, design meant the designer was on a Zoom call with you and you were in your wardrobe, you know, assessing what you could do with a shirt. 
Um, and I, uh, what that meant was that actors became, and we would work with kind of theatre makers rather than, than actors, I would think, would describe them. They came to the whole process with what happens if I hold this paperweight in front of the thing, and what happens if I hold a pair of tights over the camera, and what happens, and there was a real homemade kind of empowered aesthetic going on where people were just playing with what does this look like what does this feel like and um i think that was what was is where it felt like theater so we uh, of course we use virtual backgrounds but we also use little bits of film and little bits of glass and little bits of other things to, to change that scale and i think for um artists who want to um, step outside of those traditional roles. You know, the artists who want to have a dressing room door with their name on it, um, this is not for you, I would mm. say. I think it's for people who see themselves as makers and who want to be more uh, viscerally involved across the kind of um, spectrum of making. Um, and I think that's exciting. I think that is is only um, positive and, and it changes the goalposts for lots of people. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah, when I, when I first started experiencing work that had live actors, so I was at a show by Elaine Hoey in Emma, um, probably two years ago now, and uh, talking to her about the piece before I stepped in, she's like, oh yeah, I just have to ring the actors like to tell them to get get in the headset. And I'm like, where are the actors? And she's like, oh, one's in Belfast, one's in Carlo. It's like, what? Uh, you know, and I knew of people internationally that were doing live performance, you know, it connected live to to the experience, but I didn't know it was happening on my doorstep. So uh, yeah, Elaine is, is an amazing artist and really progressive. And uh, yeah, then I was able, because I knew they were live, I was able to like improv a little bit with one of the avatars and my partner was in the experience with me and we came out and he was like, how did they do that? <laughs> I said, no, it was live. That's why we were able to improv in the middle of the scene because it was live and, and that liveness it can only happen really you know you're never going to get ai that's going to be give you a seamless conversation maybe maybe in 20 years time jack thoughts on opportunities for artists you're working quite a lot with the artistic sector yeah i guess you know my, my first thing is if you're sitting at home an artist and you haven't tried vr yet you know get your hands on an oculus quest 2 or something because uh you know these tools are quite easy to pick up and play with. Um, and, you know, a lot of people, again, uh, see this as a gaming device, but uh, it's very quickly becoming a very competent creative tool. So, uh, you know, the first moment I played with Google Tilt Brush, which was painting in 3D, which was an incredible experience. You could never paint in 3D in the real world, and now you can. And that just really opens your mind to oh wow when you're in vr like the 3d world is just like right in front of you and you reach out and touch it whereas on computers i guess the 3d world has always been uh you know keyboard and mouse sort of quite weird to interact with i mean if you you know i guess uh take people who aren't typically gamers and try and give them a playstation controller and move through with analog sticks that's quite a difficult interaction and takes quite a bit of learning um, that you know, four-year-olds can learn, um, but you know you you do have to go through the time and learn it. Um, whereas actually VR is much more intuitive because it's you know it feels like you're using your hands a bit more. Um, so I would say you know go out and play with it um, and start conversations with companies who you want to work with um, if you have an idea. Uh, you know we're always open. There's uh, in Belfast, there's great organization, uh, two great organizations, Future Screens and Northern Ireland Screen, who are being really supportive of this whole sector. Um, and yeah, it's a really exciting time to be in this space as an artist, I think. Yeah, and I think there's so much more um, training available now, transferable skill training, like Immersive Technology Skillnet has been set up for fairly recently, less than a year old. Um, and there's tons of training on there um, and a, a lot applicable to people coming from other creative industries and sectors. Um, so I'd love to chat a bit about AOR. Um, not my area of expertise. I've created a couple of tourism apps uh, with AOR and they're not running now because of COVID. But I'd love to to chat with Zoe and Susan and Jack. I know you've worked on, on some really cool AOR stuff as well. So that whole idea of like the playable cities that, that we spoke about and uh, tying in with the audiences of the future. How do we engage public audiences in public spaces? 
I guess is the question. Zoe, I might kick off with you. So we're piloting um, a project which is called the Interactive Bus Stop, which is like a screen at a bus stop, but it, it may actually be in a piece of uh, street furniture eventually. And it's a just a screen, but it's uh, you talk to it and it talks to you and there's a coffee machine and you have conversations and uh, you can choose people to talk to. You might choose to talk to a Nigerian footballer and um, mm -hmm. you might choose to talk to somebody who's in New York at the moment. So you might choose to talk to an MLA. Um, so we're really interested in how we can develop this idea of frictionless digital interface where you don't have to use a device you just have to talk to someone um, and how to use that as an arts project um, and how to use it you know to connect people who are down the road maybe somebody's gone into a care home and someone on the screen is saying do you want to talk to and there's somebody at the care home is manipulating that right through to kind of global conversations and conversations that wouldn't exist and how it becomes you know I'm interested I'm much more interested in theatre when I don't know what's going to happen than I am if I know it's going to happen and I've got to book a ticket and, and drive there and book it so I'm really interested in ways of there being surprise encounters in unusual spaces um, which just you know bring joy or change your day or make you think differently in a way you wouldn't have done before brilliant so thank you and and susan AOR engagement with people in public spaces how do you get people to download the app and interact well so the big fix up was meant to leave, lead to a, a city scale experience uh we work with a company called phantasmo uh we did a, we did a lot of um due diligence on technologies that were out there for scanning and, and um, being able to place anchors with precision in the space. Uh, Phantasmo uh, have, been, have been great to work with and they, they send somebody out with a backpack with six cameras attached. And we chose a solution because they can also do indoors, which is really interesting to us. Um, and so before the pandemic, the idea was that the app was going to tell you, you need to get to Bristol, Gromit's been kidnapped, you need to come save him. And so we, we scanned this area, we had a plan, and then the pandemic happened, and so we said, now we don't have a plan. And so um, what we did in the first case, I think it's really interesting, is we took that data and we turned it into um, scalable dioramas. So you can saw the experience, doesn't even matter if you know where Bristol is, it allowed us to launch in the US as well as part of the test, because it didn't matter if Americans knew where Bristol was. So uh, we have these scalable dioramas that you could put on your tabletop, or you can actually get them quite large in your back garden or in a park. Um, and I actually found it a really charming way of experiencing, um, a, you know, a, bit of, a live experience or live theater, because um, I think one of the things the pandemic has taught us is it kind of sucks if people can't get there. And in long term, we should be thinking about solutions to this. Why shouldn't these they, Why shouldn't there be a hybrid solution to to, to theater and sports and, and ballet and everything else? So I think it was a really useful experiment, regardless of the fact that it was the only way to do it. Um, and now what we're doing this year is um, innovate, provided additional funding to all the demonstrators for some of the stuff that we couldn't do during the pandemic. And so we've we've gone back to the drawing board on this city experience. And we call it fix up the city. And we didn't want to do exactly what's already there in the app. So we used it as a starting point, but we went back, we re-scanned Bristol, we scanned uh, down the Bay in Cardiff, and now we have scanned Yerba Buena Gardens in San Francisco so that we can place these experiences. And what I really love about this is we're, we're pushing it further than I thought that we could. Um, you know, we, when we have glasses, it's going to be this, you know, this notion of this metaverse of, of AR experiences that exist everywhere. Um, but right now, all we have is a mobile phone, most of us anyway. And so we've always been really focused on that phone and how we can can explain what the what the point is of AR, why we should be excited about it. And so the idea with Fix Up the City is that the area is going to come to life in AR. It's not just about experiences. It's about Shouldn't there be posters on the wall? Shouldn't there be balloons? Shouldn't there be confetti? Everything, we know exactly what the area looks like. So when Big Lad fires a bubble off, it can bounce off the ground. Mm. Um, and that sort of stuff, it's amazing how much more magical and immersive it is as soon as you're like, wow, how does it know what the, where the ground is? And you know, you see Big Lad climb up on top of College Green and throw a flagpole at you and it lands right there in front of you. Like that, that kind of stuff is really cool. Um, and so that's what we're we're doing right now, and it has its own challenges. It's it's not easy. Uh, it has you know it hasn't been done that much before. Uh, we have cops asking us why we're scanning the Senate building in Cardiff at least two three times now. We've had security guards come up to say, "What are you doing?" And do you and tell I've, them it's for the big fix up? I have, and I actually had to pull out my phone and show him the recording I just made so that he knew I wasn't completely full of it. Uh, 
we have spaces that change. So there are areas that we're using that three weeks later, all of a sudden someone's put up a, you know, scaffolding or whatever it is. And so suddenly that scan becomes less reliable. So we're having to deal with that. We're having to deal with bystanders who want to know why we're going like this with a phone and they think they're being filmed. Um, testing is a challenge. We have to keep getting people out there to test. We can fake it. We can do remote testing of the experience, but we also need people out there. San Francisco is a real challenge because none of us are there and we're still not flying. So um, it's it's in many ways way more challenging than trying to do an app, trying to do the city scale stuff. But And with the testing, like how many devices are you kind of saying that your experience is compatible with? Like, do you need the, the latest? Uh, you need to be able AR to run or... AR on your phone. So yeah. for uh, an Apple device, um, that means you have to, be able to run iOS 13 or better. It actually mm -hmm. goes all the way back to the iPhone 6, which is not ideal either. Our, mm -hmm. our app, the big fix up runs best if you have like an iPhone 11 or beyond mm -hmm. but you can't you can't be you can't segment it like that on apple so we have had to optimize to go all the way backwards to iphone 6. Uh, on android um it, yeah, it's like the samsung s6 generation i'm oh, sorry s9 okay. or better yes yeah. s9 or better yeah. um that run ar kit and ar core essentially that's that's the limit okay yeah so, you don't so the same that latest greatest ipad pro with lidar scanners but that will offer its own possibilities that LIDAR is awesome you know mm -hmm. we've been early uh playing with lidar um and we've done some really cool stuff we did some stuff at the end of last year um uh, that showed uh you know wallace's pie cannon with pies clinging to the wall and pigeons coming out of the wall robot pigeons and nuts and bolts dropping all over the floor i've shared some of this stuff on on mm. like linkedin and uh it's it's pure magic um i have to hand it to apple uh, I'm really anxious for Android devices to to catch up because it is segmenting AR experiences. It's a real challenge to think about putting out a consumer app because you don't want to just support the iPhone 12 Pro. I mean, I have no idea what the install base is yet, but it's you know it's a fraction of yeah. people who can support AR. So what about everybody else? Yeah. Um, and AR is really it's really easy to break that magic. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of like animation and you get to that uncanny valley where, you know, it's not really, you know, and it's like, I don't even want to look at that. Mm -hmm. It's just too freaky. But AR is the same thing. You get really excited and it looks magic. And then you see a hand pass through a wall and it's like, oh, that's right. It's, it's not. Yeah. Magic. Or it can't find the ground because it's raining so heavy. Yeah. And even LiDAR. Like it's not it's not 100 um, percent. Mm. And so these are some of the challenges that, you know, which mm. Jack and Zoe share as well. Uh, in terms of AR, it's it's all early and it's all about kind of playing to its strengths and trying to hide the areas it's broken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jack, thoughts on that? AR and challenges? Um, yeah, for, no, like, it, it, certainly, it certainly can break very easily. Uh, it's, <laughs> we've, um, yeah, we've done uh, AR app for the BBC, sort of working with their archive and sort of spawning a timeline out in front of you and you can walk through that. Um, and we got subsequent funding on that project to, uh, build that for HoloLens and for VR. So that was a really fun way to see like, okay, how do we integrate with this across different immersive platforms? And can you use the same content to build out for all of them? And that, the answer to that seems to be yes. And the world is increasingly moving in that way, which is really exciting. So the whole open XR movement mm. um, is actually starting to mean, you know, you yeah. can, place them 3D objects, make them interactable, and say, put that on an uh, Android phone, iOS phone, uh, Quest, and HoloLens, and it would all be the same app, which really, I guess, uh, yeah, it's a big step forward in the development process because it means you're not limiting yourself to one use case because I guess phone-based AR is less impressive if you're in like a trade show environment and there's mm. lots of people with fancy demos going on you know there you probably want to be in a quest or a hololens whereas uh if you're trying to get people to download it at home and they don't have a vr headset well that's where you need phone based AR. there's no other choice mm. um so it's really trying to find the right uh technical solution for mm. i guess who's going to end up actually downloading this and we've certainly struggled to get people to download apps mm -hmm. because uh, and, you know, I think if you're considering a AR project and you haven't considered marketing um, and how people like just being on the app store uh, and publishing it, it will fall. Um, you know, doing one post about it on a social media page, it's just going to fall. You need to have that continued. So actually, you know, if you're working on an AR app, set aside a big part of your budget on 
uh, the video explaining that app is, mm. is a crucial part of it um, yeah. because, uh, yeah, it takes a lot to encourage people these days to download stuff. Um, yeah, their phones are full. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. we've also looked at like lower friction uh, AR app stuff. So using Spark AR with Facebook because people mm. already have that installed. Um, and so we did a, uh, this was a fun project with a egg producer in Northern Ireland working with the University of Ulster. Um, and we got QR codes on the egg boxes in stores that open up the app. And then we've got chickens telling you jokes and <laughs> explaining about the farm. Um, but again, it's another touch point thing is, so that was like as low friction as possible we could make AR from what we could work out. Uh, and, you know, not many scans from the egg boxes because I guess, you know, people don't scan QR codes on egg boxes very often. <laughs> right. Even now we know. Yeah. Uh, now we know, you, it's the question you were all asking. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I was curious, well, I was curious about QR codes full stop, but uh, yeah. Uh, actually, I might pose this to you, Jack, it's an interesting question in the in the chat that's come up about um, the, the scanning and the, the privacy issues that uh, Susan was describing as they were scanning some of the cities. Um, just in terms of that, that the whole privacy part and kind of digital twinning, do you, do you have kind of some thoughts on that, Jack, to... It's going to get audience. weird. It's it's fun watching, I guess, you know, everyone was terrified when Google Glass came first out. They were like, a camera in my face, ah. Um, nobody's saying this about VR or AR right now yet, even though it's exactly the same thing. It's somebody with a camera pointing in your face, mm -hmm. or multiple, a lot more cameras, and also depth sensors. <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's true of the, I guess, automated vehicles that are on our roads, is they are going to be creating live LiDAR scans of our streets all over the place. And this privacy argument is going to get increasingly important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I guess, you know, at, at the moment when you're building an AR app out, it's, you know, people do think, oh, you're pointing a phone in my face, but it's not really a problem. We're not collecting the images. It's only the tracking points. But um, mm. I think we're moving to a world where these, this stuff might become increasingly mm. uh, worrying for users. Yeah. Um, if I can so stop in for a second, though, yeah, that it, it is. And, you know, I, I know it's important with the scanning companies, you know, where, where it comes mm -hmm. to GDPR and stuff, you know, we've asked Phantasma to sort of certify for us that they're not keeping the data on just the, the incidental stuff that happens, face scanning and, and, and so forth. And uh, as I understand it, that's one of the really big holdups on a lot of the persistent anchoring is is, is what happens to that data, mm -hmm. the, the license plates, all the stuff that, you know, the noise. Uh, I think the other thing that's interesting, though, is what does it what does it mean when we anchor stuff in the environment, especially persistently? You know, random example, um, you know, uh, a, a public building and you, you put something slanderous on it as an AR anchor. Um, yeah, so it's is, really is that, fun because because <laughs> we've we've talked about I guess doing like a uh, you know world space AR graffiti app. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you know that's probably going to be used and abused by users in all sorts of terrible ways. So it's like, do you want to be responsible for that? Yeah, yeah. That's um, ethically it, tricky. Yeah. It's so totally we thoughts on that with some of the work you're doing. You, you work a lot with communities and social interactions and um is that something you're you're concerned about is kind of the, the ethical and data privacy um, yeah i mean it's something it's been interesting so whenever what, some of our digital theater shows have been kind of um cook along experiences where you're uh, a guest at a wedding um but you have to make your own dinner uh, guided by a professional chef who's kind of you know taking you through the baked alaska or the cheese souffle obviously complicated things and um the the the, the couple have chosen the 80s so there's an 80s disco and i was really i said you know what people are going to keep the cameras on because we're in their kitchens they're cooking there but actually it's been extraordinary that everybody wants to show you their kitchen to show you themselves shopping, to share their the, their prep, um, mm. and to share their 80s outfits they're considering wearing. Um, and that this could be a pandemic thing, but people, you know, the sense of the kind of colonization of the domestic space has, I think, been really interesting in terms of theater, particularly how we've been able to extend not just about 
um, people stepping into our world, this concept of we have a story world and we're inviting you in, but let us come into your world. And what happens if, you know, Jack can't see the scary monster coming behind him, but I so can, or I can send an Uber driver to Susan's door to say something about Macbeth. You know, there's a really interesting blend there. Uh, and it, it comes into privacy when, you know, you've recorded that show and how do you use that content? Um, and you know what are people sharing how much are people prepared to share in the moment and, what, and what's the kind of uh, post show kind of responsibility to that yeah and that's I think, I, yeah go ahead, sorry there's i think there's also i guess uh, quite a lot of delight when you can be inv invited into those scenarios like Amazing. Amazing. cinematic vr i've certainly found one of the most like one of the biggest things you see people doing is like if you place a 360 camera in someone's kitchen they're <laughs> having a wee nosy like looking around yeah. and seeing what's going on yeah in one, our, in one of ours the audience were you know part of a heist and they were at, at, and at one point this um actor said look if you've got war paint go and get it now and people went into their kitchens and got covered in mustard and oh. ketchup and you know we had this kind of joke that their houses were absolutely trash because they'd taken off the cushion covers <laughs> and used them as hats and they'd <laughs> staged battles in their living rooms and on this sense like we don't have to do any of these get outs like this is actually a win-win and <laughs> Where like the show would end, people would look around their homes and it wouldn't be the same. And that's actually the kind of point that it's not just about the liveness, it's about what's happening in that space mm -hmm. uh, between an audience. Um, and that's where, where uh, there is really interesting potential, I think. And that's, I guess, the other thing I'd like to add about your work, Zoe, is like what is brilliant about all your projects is you are meeting the audiences where they're at, mm. you know, and where they're at is they're on Zoom, and so you, you, you've brought it directly to them. Uh, and you know, with your current project, it's where they're at. Well, they're out on the streets. Uh, it's you know, it's not go to the app store, download an app, then then engage with this thing, which is really hard to do. Like one of the cleanest AR examples that I saw online after years of working in AR was somebody had put a bit of perspex up beside a castle and drew the outline of what used to be there from that perspective. Hmm. Uh, and I was like, yeah, I guess that works as well as some of the really <laughs> fancy, complicated things I was trying to do. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's interesting because our first li our first live piece back has been a piece called Right Up the Street, where we adapted scooters into kind of projection and they had hologram projectors and we went to people's houses and gave them stories to guard and asked them to kind of interact through, you know, you had to flash your lights and stop things happening, throw stuff out your window, you know, all of that. The street had to work together and it was kind of gaming. Um, but also there was an AR experience in that, so the show was already all uh, the audience were all linked by WhatsApp and then at one point you know all the storytellers were um, uh, held hostage and you had a you got a thing through your letterbox with, which was like a code and you put that on your floor and you uh, connected to a web they say our experience where you could see them under your floor and they were shouting let them out and what you have to do is go and throw something out your window or laugh at your window and even though it, the actual piece of AR wasn't live we only triggered it at the point in the narrative and it wasn't available before or after that. So there was a piece of the storytelling which happened in your house. Mm. So I think, yeah, it's interesting when you say you go to where the audiences are, like you're not safe even if you're in your house, will be at your door you know, in your show. Yeah, I love that, Zoe. And, and when you were talking about your work with me the other day, I was like, gosh, I'm surprised, like, or just any minute now, advertising and marketing agencies are going to be banging on Big Telly's door saying, you know, work with brands, work with brands. Um, which brings me on to kind of the topic of funding these these projects and, you know, attaining IP like Wallace and Gromit, like all of those kind of deals, I guess, that have to happen for this work to exist. Because um, it's not necessarily on, on the corporate side and creating VR or A or training apps, which has a pretty obvious kind of funding model. Um, if you can chat a bit about that, maybe Susan, start with yourself. Like, how do you make these projects happen, especially some of the really large scale projects that you've made happen? Yeah, I mean, we we couldn't have done what we did without Innovate UK funding it. You know, they it was a it was a wonderful risk that um, they they were willing to take with Audience of the Future. Thirty million pounds was set aside for a bunch of projects. Half of that went to these four demonstrators, and uh, we didn't expect to win. Uh, you know, we got we got really lucky. We're very surprised. And um, it's just been uh, tremendous uh, spending the last you know, few years creating this thing. Um, and now coming out of the end of that, you know, the, the, the grant period's about to end, looking at what the funding opportunities are, it's, it's, it's tough, um, especially in AR. I think VR, 
a little bit you're starting to see, see more opportunities. There have been some really successful games, um, and so that's helping. Uh, with AR, on the game side, the problem is game publishers don't want to touch it yet. Uh, Pokemon Go was really successful, but as, as wonderful a game as that is, it's not really an AR game so much as it's a map game. It has mm -hmm. AR. And, and All that's the users a turn off. Yeah, they do. Uh, they I, I, I only learned that later. Life. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, look, I, I I love what Niantic has done, and they, at least they've gotten AR out there in the vernacular. Of, like, and, and you could say to someone who doesn't know it, you know, like in Pokemon, like, oh, okay, I get it. And so it's Normalizer. it's a great way to start the conversation with someone who doesn't understand AR. Is have you played Pokemon Go? Uh, so, but the the problem is that's a trend that you see in other games too. If you look for AR stuff on the App Store, mostly what you're going to find is a traditional game that happens to have an AR feature. That you could turn on or turn off and so no one's taking there aren't that many risk taking uh projects out there where ar is holistic to the experience which is what we did with big fix up we said we don't ever want you to have the option of just turning off the ar that's integral to the experience and that those are the kind of risks i think we need people to start taking but uh coming from the game industry and a publishing background uh because there have been so few success stories and and the only ar games you've kind of seen since pokemon go are ones that are copying it you know, the Ghostbusters app and Jurassic Park app, it's all the same thing. And so no one's been able to show other use cases where it was successful. So where it comes to talking to game publishers, they, they want to stick with what's working right now, PC and console and stuff. So where to get funding? The VCs also, because there isn't necessarily a consumer opportunity there, they don't really see it yet either. And so I think a lot of the funding opportunities right now, and I just talked on a panel yesterday where I said the same thing, is the heart, the people with the, the most to gain from this, Apple, Facebook, HTC. guys trying to launch glasses, the telcos, you know, who yep. are also trying to push 5G. They need to be funding this stuff. They need mm. to be saying these glasses are awesome or LiDAR is awesome and and here are some use cases of it. You mm -hmm. know, it's like trying to launch a console without having any games with it. Like we mm. th this that's where the the funding needs to come from mm -hmm. is the yep. people who actually do have something to gain from it right now um because yeah. yeah it it really is it, it really is challenging and um and mm -hmm. i think it's why we haven't seen much innovation lab yeah look the lidar came out at the end of last year we're now halfway through 2021 and i've seen hardly any use cases of it on the app store uh, in mm. terms of games and if you look for ar games most of them are using technology that was out there four years ago uh, yep. they're not using mars technology they're not using the lidar technology they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're not taking those risks yet. And I think part of it is because of the funding challenges, mm -hmm. what Jack said, it's the marketing challenges. Mm -hmm. Without big publishers behind it, it's really hard to get any visibility and you fall away really quickly. So I'd echo yeah. all those things too. Yeah, and, and you guys are lucky, like Future Screens and I am lucky to be uh, partnered with Hannah Mullen, uh, another producer. Um, we are working with uh, the Animotive platform to create some uh, Macbeth scenes in VR, and that was a live to digital fund from the Lyric Theatre in Belfast and Future Screens and I, and we need loads more uh, pots of funding like that. Yeah. Comment from Danielle Whelan says, please feel free to speak to TU Dublin Hothouse about funding opportunities. So that would be for uh, companies in the South or, or creative industries in the South, Enterprise Ireland, Intertrade Ireland, uh, local enterprise offices, investors, etc. Thank you, Danielle. Any other thoughts on funding? And we will be kind of closing up in the next couple of minutes. Um, yeah, you go first, sorry. <laughs> I will, it's probably the same thing, just to shout out to Future Screens, how, you know, we're funded by the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and we're very grateful for every penny of that and that keeps us core funded. Mm. Um, but our relationship with Future Screens over the last 12 months and their, and their, um, their encouragement about seeing into the future and uh, possible um, has been absolutely uh, a game changer, I think, for us because we've, you know, always dreamt up kind of mad things and they're the people that go, this is the future, you need to try it. And, you know, we're learning, you know, I'm not saying we ever come with a, with a finished solution, but um, they've been so encouraging about allowing people to step into that water and supporting that. Mm -hmm. Any other funding bodies, Jack, to add? Um, well, I'd certainly, you know, our existing in investors, uh, Techstart, have been absolutely fantastic. They've mm -hmm. got uh, proof of concept grants. Um, where you go into that space, I guess, is, you know, uh, it tends to move away from the, like, creative and storytelling um, as a sort of, like, end goal. Yeah. <laughs> so it's got to be about, you know, a product that can scale and sell and that you, you know, you could get multiple subscribers. But I guess, you know, if you're in the AR VR space and looking to go up the BC route, if you have a scalable 
idea, then uh, yeah, I guess talk to the VCs and that works with their metrics. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And thanks. Danielle Whelan has just clarified that that um, the funding that I mentioned uh, from TU Dublin Hot House is available for the whole land of Ireland, so Northern Ireland as well. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Camille. I, I got most of that session, as I think people know when you're organising a conference, you're juggling so many things and mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't get a chance to really focus on the content until sometimes we look at the video afterwards. And if you've just joined, uh, this video will be on the... Um, ARV or Innovate to YouTube channel. So do subscribe that. That's one way that you can be sure that you reach. I really want to thank uh, the panelists. I think it was a really great discussion. Um, and I especially want to thank Camille. She's doing fantastic work uh, generally in the AR and VR sector here in Ireland. She's really been an innovator and a trailblazer. And has, uh, I think it's very successfully bridged that uh, gap, if you can call it that, between technology and the arts. And you know, doing some really interesting uh, things herself personally with Solus VR, uh, but also just in terms of the community, our immersive, which I think uh, a lot of you will be familiar with. And I know we all have great uh, hopes that our immersive, you know, will grow to be a very strong force. And certainly, we had a couple of panelists uh, there from Northern Ireland. I want to, to thank them and also say that Invest Northern Ireland. I know how I know for sure because they've been involved and supported the conference in the past. I've been. Uh, putting huge focus on immersive technology in Northern Ireland. So I think that on the island as a whole, let's hope that, you know, there's a lot of synergies that we can uh, build together. There's great work going on in the film industry, both north and, and south of the border. And I think that uh, that's a, a catalyst for future uh, developments as well. So thanks to everybody. And uh, thanks, Camille, in particular. So um, do stay tuned, everybody else. Uh, we are going to start a, a new initiative on the conference. But to the panel, you can now leave. And uh, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Zoe, Susan, Jack. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.